Greetings. Thank you for attending session two entitled Climate Change, where we'll talk about climate change and the, and the changes to our own world. We'll start off today by um, Dr. Paul Arthur Berkman, who is presenting something entitled Building Global Inclusion with Common Interests, Science and Art and Science Diplomacy in the Arctic, followed by Dr. Gillette Hall and Herman Huanca, um, talking about combating climate change and global poverty, harnessing the power of indigenous peoples. And then Dr. Agagia Rahimzadeh on socioeconomic and environmental changes leading to Chilgoza pine nut decline in Kanoar, Western Himalaya. And then last but not least, Kirthi Thulum, who will talk about climate resistance, resilience in coastal India and limits to adaptation in the face of globalization. After all the presentations, we will have a 25 minute Q&A. If you do have questions throughout the, the topics, please put them in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Right now, before we have Dr. Paul Arthur Berkman start his presentation, if you wanna go ahead and put in the chat where you did your Fulbright or where you're from or anything that made you be interested in this session, go ahead and do that. But without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Paul Berkman. Thank you, Munir. I'm going to do my very best to share a screen. Um, let's see if that works. Can you see my screen? We can. Oh, excellent. So now all I have to do is find the right. There we are. Okay. First, I'd like to thank the Fulbright program, not only for the opportunity to present tonight, which is an honor and a pleasure, uh, but for the opportunity to serve as a Fulbright Arctic Chair with Bailey Liu uh, in Norway in 2021-22, as well as at the University of Cambridge as a Fulbright Distinguished Scholar in 2007-2009. So with no further ado, uh, the focus of this session is climate. Uh, and if we think about climate, Earth's climate, uh, we're operating on a planetary scale, recognizing that every planet in our solar system has its own climate, and the climates operate at a planetary scale. Earth is a particularly important planet in our solar system because of humans and the, and the response in terms of our globally interconnected civilization today, as well as our rich history over millennia. If we look at the world today on a planetary scale, about 30% of the Earth's surface falls within the boundaries of nations, which can collectively be characterized in terms of national interests. The other 70% of the Earth's surface falls within areas that have been designated by the international community as international spaces, regions that are explicitly under international law beyond sovereign jurisdictions. And this slide illustrates the challenge that we face as a globally interconnected civilization, recognizing that nations will always first and foremost look after national interests. But on a planetary scale, the challenge we will always face as long as there are nations is one of balancing national interests and common interests. In this presentation, it's an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to represent Professor Bailey Liu from University of Texas at Austin, who is also Fulbright Arctic Chair in Norway uh, with me this year, and Dr. Daly Sambo Duro, Fulbright Arctic Scholar from 1995-96, uh, who is the Chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. With tribute to Senator Fulbright, the Fulbright program started 75 years ago and we have the opportunity to celebrate the lessons that emerged from the Fulbright program. It's important to take a sense of perspective as to the origin of the Fulbright program and the, the urgencies that we face then and that we face now. And the first part of the 20th century was marked by animosity among nations, uh, context of world wars. These were not regional wars. They weren't continental wars. They were wars on a planetary scale. And as a consequence of those global conflicts, the international community began to develop strategies to protect the survival of all on earth. We began to establish 
treaties and conventions that cross the boundaries of nations. We began to establish regions beyond sovereign jurisdictions, starting with the high seas in 1958, Antarctica in 1959, outer space in 1967, and the deep sea in 1971. I spent a year in Antarctica when I was 22. And the question that I asked during that year, scuba diving under the ice and studying giant single-celled animals, was what enabled the United States and the Soviet Union to cooperate continuously in Antarctica, as well as outer space throughout the Cold War, despite the animosities that isolated them in every other region on Earth? And that question has perplexed me for the rest of my life to this point forward. And an observation is that in a sense, the reason for that cooperation in Antarctica and outer space was because the United States and the Soviet Union began a journey of building common interests. Again, recognizing that the 20th century itself represents a period of balance between national interests and common interests. The first part of the 20th century in terms of nationalism in a world with advanced technologies and industrial capacities leading to global conflict and a risk and a warning for those nations that are around today in terms of those lessons from the 20th century. The second part of the 20th century can be marked with more hope and more optimism in terms of how we addressed those nationalistic tendencies. The Antarctic Treaty is important to share. And although this talk is about the Arctic, uh, there are lessons from the Antarctic Treaty that are relevant to the world forever after. Recognizing that it is in the interest of all mankind that Antarctica shall con continue forever to be used for peaceful, per exclusively for peaceful purposes and shall not become the scene or object of international discord. This treaty was created at the height of the Cold War. It became the very first nuclear arms agreement. And the basis for this treaty was matters of common interest. And if you ask what those matters of common interest were that brought the United States and the Soviet Union together at the height of the Cold War, these were matters of survival. We are experiencing another period of matters of survival at local to global scales. This diagram just illustrates what those matters of common interest are, including peaceful purposes only, but the keystone common interest that enabled the United States and the Soviet Union to cooperate continuously throughout the Cold War was science. This quote came from the Senate hearings in 1960 when the United States was ratifying the Antarctic Treaty, bringing it into force for the United States. Senator Fulbright was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He was the longest standing chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to date in the United States Senate. The Antarctic Treaty is indispensable to the world of science, which knows no national or other political boundaries, but it is much more than that. It is a document unique in history, which may take its place alongside the Magna Carta and other great symbols of man's quest for enlightenment and order. If we think about the Magna Carta in context, we can see across eight centuries, 800 years, its influence on constitutional law, and the development of democracies. This statement in 1960s imagines 800 years into the future. And we're at that point now as a civilization when the decisions we make will influence centuries into the future. It's a profound responsibility. And Senator Fulbright created an opportunity for aspiring, creative, passionate individuals with a sense of responsibility to lead and create a world that is stable, resilient, and balanced in the face of change. If we look at that change today, we can see the change certainly in the face of a pandemic over time frame of months to years. We can see exponential change in terms of mortality, loss of life, as well as loss of livelihoods. We can see exponential change over years to decades in terms of advanced technologies chips on a computer, artificial intelligence, cyber security, all of the issues of genomics, all of that happening over years to decades. And we can certainly see in the context of climate, changes that are happening over decades to centuries in terms of not only changes in atmospheric carbon, but also the 
global human population size from 1 billion people on earth in 1800 at the beginning of the industrial revolution, 2 billion people on earth just after World War II and the pandemic a century ago, to 8 billion people living on earth this decade. The challenges we face are exponential. They're not linear. They're not changes about the mean. These are exponential changes at the time scale of months to years, years to decades, and decades to centuries. And it is with this perspective that we have the challenge of operating on a planetary scale. In the context of thinking across time, at the moment, at the immediate moment in terms of responses, we have urgencies that are clearly happening in terms of risks of political, economic, societal, environmental instabilities that governments at local to global scales must deal with as security issues. We also have urgencies that operate across sustainability timescales, balancing societal, economic, and environmental considerations across generations. It's not one end of the member, one end member or the other. The challenge is to operate across a continuum of urgencies from security to sustainability timescales for the interests of nations, peoples, and our world. If we think about it in this context, most of the discussions among various nations, among various people, is born with conflict. The world is in a state of gloom and doom because we see conflict constantly in terms of the media, in terms of social interactions. There is an alternative. The alternative is to think in terms of common interests. And the 20th century illustrates that it is possible even among the most severe adversaries in the context of the United States and the Soviet Union to begin their dialogue based on common interests. It is a choice. It is a choice that exists in every negotiation. Just like when you see a glass of water that is half full or half empty, there is a choice to begin a negotiation based on conflict or based on common interests. And the observation is that the starting point determines the journey. If you start from a position of conflict, the journey will be filled with conflict. If you start from a position of common interests, the journey will be filled with cooperation. Both conflict resolution and common interest building have the same objective, to promote cooperation and prevent conflict. However, the journeys are entirely different. The opportunity is at local to global scales to understand that there is this choice and to accentuate the opportunities and training to think in terms of common interests, not only in terms of conflict. This talk is about the Arctic and it truly is a pleasure to, to share in this presentation with Professor Bailey Liu and, and Dr. Daly Samboduro in terms of thinking about the Arctic, what it means as a region of profound change. It is in a sense, the bellwether of climate. We can see an acceleration of climate change in the polar regions, twice that as the rest of the world. In the Arctic Ocean, the Arctic Ocean is opening up. More than half of the Arctic Ocean today is ice free during the summer. As a consequence, it's opening the opportunity for shipping, as you can see in this figure with the longest continuous satellite record of ship traffic. Ship traffic itself represents socioeconomic change, change that can be measured and assessed in the terms of movements of ships at the times of minutes over years. We can understand the nations, the size of ships, and all of those features in relation to the biogeophysical components of the system itself. Changes in sea ice, the movement of, of fish species, temperature changes, marine mammals, and so on. Challenge is to integrate all of this information and to make decisions that operate short to long term, that are informed across a continuum of urgencies. This figure itself is intended to represent an international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive perspective of the Arctic. The interdisciplinary component is represented by the sea ice, the white area in the middle. This is the minimum sea ice extent that's been observed during the satellite era in 2012. 
The red lines around that is the Central Arctic Ocean high seas. This is a region that is explicitly beyond sovereign jurisdictions under international law. The colored areas around the, surrounding the Arctic Ocean represent the indigenous peoples organizations. And within those regions are also the Arctic states, eight Arctic states, coastal and non-coastal states. Together, these features represent the international, the interdisciplinary, and most challenging to consider is the inclusive components of the system. Today, we live in a world where there is inherent exclusion. Nations by themselves are exclusive in the design of borders and boundaries. Governments are inherently exclusive in the same way. The challenge that we face is to be inclusive. And those opportunities, such as with the Fulbright program, that create bridges among nations, among people, develop friendships, develop relationships that enable thinking in an inclusive way are special and are essential to how we will emerge as a globally interconnected civilization. Out of this process has come the concept of science diplomacy. Science diplomacy itself is a language, a language of hope. And like any language, it has words and syntax and phrases and concepts that require an understanding of how that language operates. But the language itself is one of communication. And just as an illustration, I sit here today in Moscow as the director of the Science Diplomacy Center at Mgimo University, which is supported by the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs as an American. That language of hope operates in very practical ways to bring together dialogues among allies and adversaries alike, to think with inspiration and passion about how the world will operate into the distant future. Context of science diplomacy itself is a process. And in this sense, diplomacy is a process as opposed to policy, which is a product. Science diplomacy is an international, interdisciplinary and inclusive process. It operates with informed decision-making, thinking short to long-term with the objective of balancing national interests and common interests for the benefit of all on earth across generations. The context of for the benefit of all on earth across generations itself is designed to be inclusive, not only humans, but everything on earth, the mountains, the rivers, the fish, the birds, everything on earth is part of our stewardship as humans on earth. It is not only for humanity that we have responsibility, it is for all on earth we have responsibility. The art component is all over the place in these types of slides, but I would like to accentuate the, the, the inspiration and the gifts of, of Professor De, of Bailey Liu. Bailey has created a number of exhibits that use red threads, the concept of red threads. And Bailey has the notion from her background in China, that ancient Chinese legend of the red thread tells where children are born, invisible red threads connect them to their soulmates. Over years of their lives, they come closer and eventually find each other, overcoming great divides and distances. The notion of a red thread woven between periods, between bridges across divides is something that we all share. And this image, resonates in terms of our challenge as well as our responsibility as a globally interconnected civilization to find these Paul, special just, threads. Paul, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to give you a, a... Yes, please. You wanted I just to want to give you a warning on the time. That's fine. I'm just concluding. Thank you. You're welcome. The context of art and science together are means of communication. And it is a tribute to the Fulbright program in terms of the types of people that are involved, musicians, artists, scientists, historians, lawyers, all of the S elements of our society are represented by the Fulbright program. The opportunity is for these individuals to recognize that they are integrating education, research, and leadership for the benefit of all on earth. And I leave you with this last slide, which is an, 
image drawn from Colleen Charles in the Korean nation in the northern part of, the, of North America, what is called the trap line. And it a sense symbolizes, at least for me, the notion of a journey. We are on a shared journey as a globally interconnected civilization, recognizing that we are just in our infancy. The world wars that happened in the 20th century happened no other century in history, just the 20th century. The oldest calendars on earth are around 6,000 years old, 60 centuries. We are just in our infancy as a globally interconnected civilization, setting expectations properly. The types of programs like the Fulbright program open windows into the future. And it is truly an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to share these insights on the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Gillette Hall. It's very much a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see. I think our presentation follows very nicely from Paul's. Um, so thank you so much for introducing us and laying out such a nice foundation um, this morning. So, um, Herman and I represent a group of three Fulbright scholars partnered together to bring about faster global climate change, mitigation and adaptation, as well as poverty reduction, capitalizing on the full potential of indigenous peoples to contribute to both of these ends. We work together under the Forest Stewardship Council Indigenous Foundation which has launched the Indigenous Peoples Alliance for Rights and Development. This is a global alliance funded by USAID, the Forest Stewardship Council, and also the private sector. And so in line with this Fulbright annual conference theme, celebrating a legacy of global friendships, we're excited to be here today to share our experience with the Fulbright community and to hopefully open up avenues for collaboration. I'll begin our presentation by laying out the global context that motivates our work, and then I'll turn it over to Germán Huanca, who will lay out four major challenges we see that Indigenous peoples face today, and then some examples of how we see the path forward. Indigenous peoples and local communities manage fully one quarter of the planet's territory. And I think Paul alluded to this previously. These territories are home to around 370 million indigenous peoples, and they also present a massive global environmental asset. Indigenous territories contain nearly 300 billion metric tons of both above and below ground carbon stocks. 80% of the planet's remaining biodiversity and 40% of the world's native forests, which if appropriately harnessed can be the basis for addressing ongoing climate change, deforestation, as well as biodiversity loss. So it's no coincidence that where biodiversity and vegetation are found, indigenous peoples reside. And this is because indigenous peoples have a demonstrated mastery in environmental protection. So as just a few examples, resting the soil after producing a crop to recover its nutritional properties instead of using agrochemicals is a traditional indigenous practice as is sustainable forestry management. However, indigenous peoples so far do all of this and produce this incredible public good without any support or with very little support or remuneration for these tremendously valuable public goods that they provide to us all. And what's more, they also come under outright opposition and even sometimes attack. So as you can see by the slide, um, several points to make here are just that indigenous lands are often under threat um, for misappropriation and unsustainable use such as cattle ranching. Um, their land tenure is very insecure and existing treaties are often violated. 
What's more, indigenous activists are often targeted and even killed. And you can see from my slide there, some of the data. Um, interestingly, and this connects to my own research, Indigenous people are also highly overrepresented among the global extreme poor. Indigenous peoples make up one third of the rural poor around the world, despite the fact that they represent less than 5% of the global population. They also make up 15% of the extreme poor. The marginalization of indigenous peoples happens to be one of the main reasons, therefore, for stalled progress in global extreme poverty reduction. But so is climate change itself. And there's a new report out by the World Bank that suggests that climate change unabated will drive an estimated 68 million to 135 million additional people into extreme poverty by 2030, unless we do something about this. So in sum, indigenous peoples, sorry, I advanced too quickly there. Indigenous peoples are a key to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Climate change mitigation is a key to extreme poverty reduction and indigenous peoples make up overwhelmingly are, are highly overrepresented in the global extreme poor. So basically what we find, what we sustain is that the abrogation of indigenous people's rights, the climate crisis and global poverty reduction are interrelated problems. And that's what we have come together as a partnership to address. And I turn it over to Herman. Thank you, Gillette. And uh, thank you also to introduce uh, the topic uh, for this uh, today, uh, Paul. You know? And uh, let me continue the presentation. And, uh, and uh, Gillette, please, could you help me all also to go ahead with the, 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 the presentation? Yeah. There are four major challenges uh, that hold indigenous people back from having their full positive impact on climate protection and global poverty reduction. The first is the current global economic development strategies do not assign value to the public goods that indigenous communities generate, nor do they support sustainable economic development opportunities which respect the rights and traditional practices of indigenous people. For example, roads are constructed without consideration of sacred areas. Areas where bears roost, roads do not include bridges for animals. Roads are destroying both indigenous habitats and the forest ecosystem they protect. Second, indigenous people have limited technical and institutional capabilities to protect and develop their rights, territories, and livelihoods. One fundamental reason for this is the inequity in public investment, particularly education. Indigenous people's educational opportunities are mostly limited to primary schooling, and the quality is devastatingly poor. The least educated and experienced teachers are allocated to indigenous communities. In my example, I have to live from my early age, from 30 years old from my community to study, for example, high school. Third, indigenous people are denied the ability to enforce legal frameworks, and they are often unable to negotiate, participate in, and influence decision-making processes. On the one hand, most indigenous people organizations are not recognized by governments. And on the other, laws do not allow political representations through indigenous people organizations just political parties, most of which tend to include, in this case, exclude or diminish indigenous representations. And finally, the financial mechanism for climate protection are not reaching the real custodians of forest resources. More broadly, payment for environmental services are not part of the public policies linked to indigenous people. Market certification is one example among many of the types of initiative we support to address these challenges. Market certification 
addresses a common market barrier faced by indigenous communities. Indigenous produce is of excellent organic quality, but often fails to pass standard market certification requirements for size, color, packaging, and others. An indigenous certification would provide exemptions for high quality indigenous produce. Consumer buying these products would be educated that natural products come in non-standard color, size, and weight, and they are playing an important role in environmental protection with every purchase of an indigenous certified product. Our partnership is working on a range of other initiatives, all of which aim to achieve these three things. One, mobilization of resources to support self-determined indigenous initiative and public-private sector partnership that generate value for the, for the public goods that is environmental asset generated by indigenous people. Second, indigenous development in indigenous communities creating business linkages with the private sector, strengthening indigenous value chain opportunities and connectivity with the global market. Third, we transfer of knowledge from successful indigenous enterprises and businesses to others, including capacity building in monitoring, negotiating, organizational and technical skills. So in closing, we seek faster climate change mitigation and global poverty reduction via of indigenous land rights and self-determination. Innovative public-private sector partnership to invest in climate mitigation and sustainable growth in indigenous community, including the financial valuation of public environmental goods that indigenous people excel of providing. New ideas, funding sources and partners to join our work. We welcome your questions, ideas and suggestions after all the presenters have made. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Agagia and I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to talk to you about my research today by taking you on a journey to Western Himalaya. The focus of my presentation is on the decline of the Chilgoza pine nuts of Kinar. Kinar is a tribal district adjacent to the Tibetan border in the state of Himachal Pradesh in the Indian Himalaya. This is a high elevation mountainous area that is rugged with scarce cultivable land and small land holding sizes. In recent decades, climate change has especially been threatening with extreme weather events that can potentially destroy what limited fertile land exists. Before India's independence in 1947, the Kinaris were subsistence agropastoralists. They didn't have a cash-based economy. The chilgos of pine nuts were the only means of monetary revenue and were used for bartering. Post-independence, the region was brought into the larger Indian economy through commercial horticulture, in this case, apples as a cash crop. So market integration initiated Kinar's transition from a pre-capitalist economy to a cash-based economy. Apple production is now Kinar's primary source of income. Despite relative prosperity in the region, some of the ramifications of this economic transition are the decline of the Chilgoza pine forest and also the decline of social cooperation. So what is Chilgoza? 
Chilgoza is a pine tree that's native to the dry temperate forest of the Hindu Kush Himalaya. In this region, it's confined to small pockets in Western Himalaya, including in the district of Kinnor. These trees grow in harsh conditions and actually flourish in areas with little rain and heavy snowfall. The trees take about 30 years to produce cones and the cones take about a year and a half to reach maturity and produce seeds or pine nuts. Chilgoza trees have historically played a significant socioeconomic and ecological role for the Kinaris to the point where the people of Kinar called them uh, universally refer to Chilgoza as God's gift to Kinar because these trees don't require any inputs. As a source of livelihood, Chilgoza was used as a trade commodity, as I mentioned earlier, and it still today offers a supplementary source of income. Chilgoza is also a, par a part of the Kinari tribal identity and plays a role in social obligations. Garlands of Chilgoza are offered during various functions. Nutritionally, the high fat content of pine nuts has been an important dietary source, especially during long winter months. And ecologically, because Chilgoza trees grow on shallow and rocky soil, they prevent erosion and landslides. Chilgoza trees exist both on private lands as well as on common village forests. Each village has access and usufruct rights to its common village Chilgoza forest. Traditionally, harvesting was done collectively by all villagers and all decisions about the harvest and distribution were also made by local traditional committees. Sustainable methods were used to collect for self-consumption and for barter. Generally, only ripe cones were picked and the smaller, younger cones were left on the tree for the following year's harvest and also for regeneration of new saplings. Seed extraction was and still is done by village members and this is usually by women. So the Chilgoza forests have been declining globally. In fact, natural regeneration is extremely slow. In Kinar, that rate is about 15%. In 1998, the Chilgoza forests were placed on the IUCN's red list of threatened species. And by 2013, they were reclassified as near threatened. Some of the reasons for this decline are climate change, the apple economy, what I call dilapidated development, and also unsustainable harvesting practices. Let's talk about climate change first. Kinar has historically received precipitation in the form of winter and spring snow, which contribute to the formation of its dry temperate forests where the Chilgoza pine trees can thrive. This is all changing. The Himalaya in general has experienced this significant warming trend. Kinaris have already been experiencing extreme weather events like droughts, severe winter storms, and uncommon and unseasonal rain and snowfall, all of which trigger avalanches and landslides that destroy orchards, farms, and tourism infrastructure and cause road closure and communication cutoffs for weeks. Kinari's perception is that the changing weather patterns, including reduced snowfall and increase in rain, are damaging the Chilgoza trees. Lack of adequate soil moisture from snow affects regeneration of Chilgoza seeds, and that seems to be happening. The market economy of the last seven decades has transformed Kinar and is also contributing to Chilgoza's decline. 
because of this overall rural transformation and emphasis on apple production, Chilgoza is slowly losing importance in the rural economy. As I mentioned earlier, because land holding sizes are small, maximization of apple production puts Chilgoza trees at a disadvantage. I'll give you an example here. In 2009, I came across a forested area that was being developed into an apple orchard. The landowner owned more land with productive apple orchards nearby. In this new plot, terraces were being built and about 100 apple saplings were being planted. The property owner was removing 12 Chilgoza trees and lopping the rest to make room and light for the coming apple orchard. This has become a common trend in Kinor. Infrastructural development or dilapidated development also contributes to Chilgoza's decline. By dilapidated development, I mean development practices that are destined to fail from the onset because they don't equitably and sustainably serve the majority of the people, and they may contribute to environmental degradation. Precariously carved roads into the forest and higher elevation areas are one example. Road construction onto fragile mountain slopes has increased in the last five years in many places in Kinar. Other examples are unplanned expansion of buildings and hydroelectric projects, also an unplanned tourism industry that uses resources and produces waste, all of which contribute to deforestation while also damaging existing Chilgoza trees. Then there are contemporary harvesting practices. Today, the harvest is largely auctioned to commercial contractors who then hire laborers to do the actual harvest, whereas in the past, this was done by villagers themselves. Today's harvesting method is generally unsustainable. For example, to access a difficult to reach mature cone at the end of a branch, the entire branch is cut which terminates every cone on the branch, including the undeveloped cones that traditionally were left for the following year's harvest or for the regeneration of the tree. Contractors general, generally blame the laborers for not following rules. Now, these laborers are seasonal migrants from Nepal, earning a daily wage. They don't have a lot of rights, and generally they follow the orders of their bosses. Taking care and harvesting will cost the contractors more money for labor. So short-term profit takes precedence over the long-term health of this local native species. Chilgoza's decline largely represents a rise in the vulnerability of the Kinari society in light of climate change, increase in cash crop production, and weakening of social networks that have traditionally functioned as social insurance for Kinaris. The loss of Chilgoza forest will contribute to ecological disruption, including habitat and biodiversity loss. Socially, its loss may have consequences on food and livelihood security. For the last 20 years, monocultured apple orchards have covered the limited cultivable land, bringing prosperity to Kinar, but also affecting the livelihood diversity of the region. Declining diversity coupled with climate change may possibly weaken resilience to economic or environmental shocks. Thank you very much for your attention. Next, we'll have Kirthi Thulum to present. 
Thank you, Winaren. Thank you so much to the Fulbright Association. Um, I will share my screen now. Can everyone see that? Looks good. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Krithi Salam, and I was a Fulbright Scholar in 2019-20. So it was an interesting time. Um, the pandemic kind of actually cut the program early, but um, luckily there were some really, really interesting takeaways for the work that I did in um, Andhra Pradesh, east coast of India, in a city called Vishakhapatnam. So today I'll be speaking about limits to adaptation in the face of coastal climate change, the missing piece for successful climate resilience in India. Global climate change has the potential to severely impact human health worldwide, particularly through waterborne pathways in coastal communities. The challenge lies in the ability to understand this relationship, detecting and understanding climatic trends as they relate to disease incidences requires large, consistent, and clear data sets that can distinguish seasonal and interannual variation in climatic trends. This study proposes that a concerted and serious effort is mandatory to acquire complete, long-term, and diverse data sets on climatic and disease trends, even once an epidemic has passed for Vishakhapatnam and surrounding regions. The second part of the study, which is primarily what I will actually focus on today, and I apologize, I forgot to mention there's two parts of this, um, is us reviewing insights from indigenous artisanal fishing communities along the coast of Vishakhapatnam district in Andhra Pradesh to obtain a glimpse into the pressures that artisanal fishing communities have undergone over this generation's lifetime due to urbanization and globalization, coupled with increasing pressures of climate change. Southeast Asia is one of the most sensitive regions to our pressing climate crisis. With climate change being one of the most urgent issues of our time, it is of heightened importance to further understand how Southeast Asian regions might respond to these changes. Conclusions in this study are based on eight months of ethnographic research in coastal fisher communities and government interviews. Historical data was collected from archives and interviews with territorial officials and NGO, NGO workers, which was to complement the insight that I gleaned from the extensive participant observation and field collection among the deep sea fisher populations in Vishakhapatnam along the coast of Andhra Pradesh. Of fishing people aquaculturists, 85% of them live in Asia and 90% are small scale. Though Southeast Asia is the second largest wild caught seafood, seafood producer and the third largest for aquaculture, environmental change is compromising the coastal resilience. 88% of South Asian, Southeast Asian reefs are at risk and fishery landings are already 64% higher than can be sustained. So there is a recognized need to adapt to changing climate conditions, but minimal discourse of the limits to such adaptation especially in urban settings. Limits are tra traditionally analyzed as a set of immutable thresholds and biological, technological, or economic parameters. But this study contends that the limits to adaptation are endogenous to society, con contingent on ethics, like a lot of the speakers previously have spoken about, responses, perspectives, knowledge, and culture. So that is why we attain, uh, attempted, excuse me, to review the insight from these artisanal fishing communities. Fishing is one of the primary activities in Vishakhapatnam. The city itself hosts one of the most prominent international fishing ports in the world. In fact, the district is, the city is responsible for around 70% of the export value with an, oops, with an estimated 25% um, of the fishing industry labor of Andhra Pradesh coming from Vishakhapatnam. Within Vishakhapatnam, there are approximately 118 primary fisher cooperatives, about 3,000 mechanized boats, and about 2,500 non-mechanized boats. And I just wanna point out that what that means is that this, these 2,500 boats, basically non-mechanized boats, these fishermen have, despite 
support to get mechanized boats have refused to do that because they don't want to increase the amounts they're fishing. They want to continue in a cultural way that they've always known and they're not trying to gather more fish than what they need. And that was an insight that I personally found really interesting. However, between 1970 to 1980, the dynamic of the district began to change. The disparities between urban and rural populations grew with slums increasing from approximately 85 to 275. Although economic growth and globalization are often used as measurements of a country's growth, such fast growth with growth without the infrastructure to do so can be quite consequential. With a heavy influx of human populations, there was a new pressure put on the economy, the land, the climate, and the coast of the Shakopanon. Socioeconomic, sociodemographic, and environmental issues came into light. And although not immediately observed, have begun to show dramatic consequences in recent years. Accelerated growth rates all over the country have basically increased major industrial growth as well. So we've noticed a lot of fishing communities switching from their jobs that they and their families have known for generations for industrial um, employment. Fishermen and women have also begin, begun migrating from their native homes seeking work elsewhere to keep up with the rest of the country's growth. In fact, between 1991 and 2001, just about 10 years, India saw the number of domestic migrants increase by a whopping 61% with some of the most prominent states, including Mumbai, Andhra Pradesh, Delhi, and Gujarat. So in our study, this part, partially the city of Vishakhapatnam, in, in our study, we studied five villages, as you will see here, when I zoom in, this is basically the ge geographical and spatial distribution of these cities, of these um, uh, villages, which are actually also called mundos um, in this part of the world. So we did full interviews of 51 men and the men were full-time fishermen. And then we did 74 household surveys of the women and young boys. And I also wanna make note here that the women were probably even more involved in the fishing economy than the men because they took care of the majority of all economic trade and, and expenses and management while the men were out fishing uh, in the morning. So the research questions that we asked were, what are the limits to adaptation of artisanal fishing communities in the Shakopanam in the face of anthropogenic-based climate change? How are these limits impacting adaptation? How do these changes affect the health of the residents in this community? And how do the limits differ between urban and rural communities? We conducted district representative, semi-structured in-depth interviews of the five of, five of the main villages in Vishakhapatnam, which was about 125 households. For each interview, as you see a sample here, the name, age, sex of the fishermen being interviewed, current household size, and multiple other factors of data were gathered to be able to conduct our analyses. We found that diseases were a prevalent issue within these artisanal fishing communities, including cholera, dengue, di diarrhea, AIDS, and the flu. Diseases stemmed from poor sanitary conditions, unplanned streets, poor road networks, illiteracy, sociocultural pollution, and environmental pollution are some of the main drivers. But these issues essentially stem from urbanization, a lack of waste management, and the lack of governmental support. So unfortunately, as these artisanal fishing communities began to watch their small scale industry being wiped clean by globalization and minimally regulated international com commercial fishing, the consequential behavior became fisher migration. One of the most significant distinctions between Vishakhapatnam and the other cities in Andhra Pradesh is that it is highly influenced by its coastline. The coastline is a dynamic entity responding to extern external forces, including cyclones, near shore currents, anthropogenic activity, and geophysical dynamics. As sediment, sediment transport that enters particular areas is greater than sediment going out in other areas, beach erosion starts started to occur. However, that equilibrium started to be disturbed due to anthropogenic activity, climate change, et cetera, at which point we've often seen of fishermen start to kind of disperse from the areas they've always known to fish in. Another consequence too, was that fishermen would even have to go deeper and further out into the ocean 
to be able to catch the, basically the same amount of fish or less than they used to catch. So the erosion not only caused coastal and land issues, but it also caused water issues for the people who were essentially dependent on this land. The design of practical long-term land use and coastal sustainability practices to mitigate and reduce these losses is going to be necessary. So this requires not only a comprehensive analysis of regional shore dynamics, something that we've tried to do, but also in will involve stringent intentional policies that integrate the needs of the indig indigenous fisher communities in Vishakhapatnam. Another prominent issue that arose was climate change and environmental degradation. So this mostly included the loss of forest space, pasture, farmland, agricultural land, and indigenous land. In Andhra Pradesh and actually in the neighboring state of Orissa, fisher migration became an increasingly popular solution at such a, excuse me, as rapid urbanization forced these indigenous communities to the outskirts of their territories. And the term became labeled as environmental refugees. Most of these refugees were forced to move into cities and find work in urban spaces. Many fishing communities along the coast of the Bay of Bengal have begun to dwindle in numbers as the next generation has come into the picture. In fact, when I talked to most of these fishing communities, what I noticed was most of the offspring of this generation's fishermen and women have entered into construction work, industries, um, even education-based opportunities in order to fill the gaps in the workforces of the country. And some of that is not voluntary, which is a whole other topic in itself. Environmental refugees often lack governmental support, proper infrastructure, and legal protection when they are fo forced to move across national boundaries. Other issues have included exacerbated poverty due to a weak socioeconomic structure, poor educational facilities, little or no employment or opportunities in local urban areas, no medical or health support, and a, a whole set series of pollution. Instead of being initiated on a state level, coastal governance and fishing policies and processes are initiated by international agencies when industries seek large-scale development of India's marine ecosystems. Although intended as an inclusive, holistic process to plan industrial development, this assemblage of technologies, processes, and practices mandated by international corporations produces a particular power relation through its rejection of local knowledge and insistence on data, for instance, in the form of discrete geocoded polygons. This is something that I face, and that's actually I faced it throughout my entire time, um, attempting to understand the fishing communities from a more social science perspective versus a quantitative science perspective. So my work argues that this form of ocean governance produces an ontological politics, despite emerging from what may seem rational for economic purposes. The case of externally mandated coastal governance in India demonstrates that non-state actors can, can initiate coastal governance, and therefore it opens the possibility for fishing communities as non-state actors to directly engage with the assemblage of practices that produce sustainable, long-term, stakeholder-involved coastal protection, fishing protection, and ocean governance for generations to come. So my call here is that we include our fishing communities in the context of our policy solutions. Every other speaker, Dr. Berkman and all spoke about how, about the topic of global inclusion, I actually really appreciated that, and I agree. My research shows that the local dimensions as well of indigenous fishing, often overlooked or just purely ignored, are to the detriment of the communities sharing that space with them, and those are mostly urban communities. Local fishermen and women and fishing communities are part of the solution, but, but should also be a part of the problem solving as our paper breaks down in more detail. More attention needs to be paid to the enhancement of inclusive governance structures, the formulation and implementation of policies and regulations that take local fishing communities and fishermen and women into account, and accountable cooperation between local and national governmental authorities. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank every fishing community I worked with in Chakrabhatnam for their time and their trust, um, the founder of the VSTCA organization in India, Fulbright, thank you so much and happy 75th anniversary.
um, Geetham University, the University of Oxford, and Stanford, with whom I work now. Thank you so much to our entire panel. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to bring their video and audio back online, and we'll uh, answer questions from the audience. Um, the first question um, I have here is for uh, Dr. Berkman. Actually, already answered this in the Q and A, but I just want it for the entire um, entire uh, audience. Um, those uh, agreements that you had on your presentation were a long time ago. Um, how can we um, rediscover that cooperation in an era of tribalism and um, just some other other questions for you about um, if Fulbright does have a, a, a role to play in that? Did you want me to answer that some more? Uh, uh, yeah, d just your, your answer, it doesn't go to the entire, uh, your answer was really good and it didn't go to the entire audience. So I just wanted to, to get it on the recording. Okay. Um, so the, the question related to the observation that the um, agreements were long ago, um, in a sense, the Arctic has gone through a, a transition in 2009, um, where the concept of peace began to be discussed among the eight Arctic states and declared in their um, dec ministerial declarations. And since 2009, there have been five binding agreements that have emerged. The first was a search and rescue agreement in 2011, a pollution preparedness and response agreement in 2013, an agreement on enhancing international Arctic scientific cooperation, which is actually of global relevance in terms of enhancing international scientific cooperation generally, a polar code on shipping in the Arctic, as well as the Antarctic. And in 2018, and just came into force in June of this year, a fisheries agreement in the Central Arctic Ocean high seas. And the question about indigenous peoples, um, I did a mapping of the various terms in these five agreements. Interestingly, indigenous peoples occurs most in the, in the most recent agreement dealing with the Central Arctic Ocean High Seas, which is a region beyond sovereign jurisdiction. Indigenous peoples occurs more in that agreement than any of the other binding Arctic agreements. Thank you. Another question we have is uh, probably relevant for, um, for the other three panelists, um, Dr. Rahim, Z Rahim Zadeh, uh, Kirthi, and Dr. Gillette, and Herman Huanca. Um, a question was about what do local governments or authorities, uh, what role do they play in these climate change, in climate change and how it affects um, people who are remote or indigenous people? And we'll, we'll do it, um, Dr. Gillette and uh, Herman, if you want to go first. Herman, do you want to speak? Go ahead, uh, uh, Gillette, and I will okay. call well, I'll just keep it brief. I mean, <laughs> there are some exceptions to this, but the typical pattern that I see is that um, local governments are, you know, they're balancing many different priorities. And in most countries, the interests of indigenous peoples falls um, behind larger scale industrial or business interests. And so while there is potentially a great role um, for national governments to play, um, in, in many cases that role is not yet being taken up, um, I would say in our view sufficiently in order to produce the results that we're driving towards. Yeah, and uh, another. There is an effort currently that uh, we are uh, working on that is putting together for it in, in a all resource of uh, for indigenous uh, people. You know that that uh, currently that many organizations are working on on this on this on this issue, and we are uh, forming a uh, virtual learning database. You know platform, but that. Many people, many of you can uh, can reach, you know, and later and, and take the, the information from that site and uh, 
that will be you know one way for uh, for interacting co with us no Agagia or Kirthi? Sure. Um, I agree with Dr. Gillett and Herman um, in that based on my experience too in Kinar, which is also a tribal community, indigenous community, I have not personally seen any significant government initiatives regarding climate change adaptation and mitigation. I'll unfortunately have to echo the same. I will add that one of the ways that I think is in, has worked in Vishakhabandam to some extent is um, repetitive sound about it. So bringing government attention, constantly reminding them that these are people who are here, they're part of their communities and we're not going, they're not going to be forgotten. It was something that our work did where we actually were able to make a very small policy change because of a lot of advocacy over the last year. So I'd say that it's a slow process, but um, it's very possible. I also want to add that the fish, the indigenous communities that I'll, I'll, you know, I'll speak for, for myself, but I don't believe they are victims to anything. I think that they are personally put in a situation that I think if any of us were put in as communities or as individuals would be absolutely kind of like to the to the breaking point where migration and other solutions are the only way they know how to address these problems. So they aren't victims, but I think we can do a better job as urban societies of taking care of all of our people. Thank you. Um, another question that is probably for all panelists. Um, can you tell us some examples of challenges you face uh, during your research um, interacting with um, uh, one example was, um, you know, uh, Kirthi, you're uh, a female who's trying to do research in a very predominantly male profession of fishing, um, or Dr. Agagia, like uh, interacting with um, remote people who might not understand why you're talking to them or interested in the research. Um, and um, just in general, and, you know, interacting with Indigenous people and trying to, what, what type of examples of challenges have you face during your research in general? Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, I didn't really have many challenges in terms of uh, interacting with Kinaris. I felt very welcomed and um, people were very open to speaking with me about um, but all the issues and the dynamics that are happening in Kinar. Uh, I mean, the challenges were really being in a remote high mountainous area that was cold and uh, in terms of weather patterns, it was unpredictable. So, and, and, be, and probably as most Fulbrighters can um, relate to this, just feeling lonely at times being in a remote area. In my in my life, I am I am an indigenous, you know, coming from one community. And what happened is, uh, I uh, when I was doing research in another indigenous territory, because sometimes we think that everything, all indigenous are in the same, you know, are equal. Not, not first of all, no, there are different languages, different cultures, and uh, and uh, for me as an Aymara, for example, was. To be uh, to be in a Mohenyo Ignaciano territory, the first thing has to be to understand, you know, the culture. You, you, there are different ways to understand, and when you open uh, the, the conversation and you open the, the research, because you are trying to to get everything, you know, in in a good way, and uh, they they open they open the, the door for you for everything, but. What is the big problem when when you go and try to do a research? When you go just for a, a as a foreign and say, okay, I want to do something, but you don't involve yourself, you know, in all the life. Even fishing, for example, can be part of their life, and you have to go with them and fish, you know, and then cook with their food, and you have to do the same thing that they, they are doing, and they will be happy and they will be open to you. But otherwise, 
they will they they, they will give they will tell you uh, everything that you want to hear. Mm. Yeah, that's the <laughs> okay. So oh, thank you. Excellent answer. Um, any of the other panelists, if you'd like to come, otherwise, I have more questions. Just as a general comment, um, but I'll, I'll leave it to Critty first, please, Critty. Um, it's okay, Dr. Berman, go ahead. <laughs> no, please, please. Okay. okay, well, I just wanted to thank Herman for that comment. I think that's very powerful. Um, and, you know, um, as somebody who's not from an indigenous community, I think it's something for me to constantly reflect on. To answer that question too, I just wanted to add that I, I actually found the interviews that I did kind of the best time I had. And I, I, on the contrary, I struggled to actually feel accepted by more of the urban communities, which is something I'm reflecting on now seeing this question. So I think, um, for they, yeah, they, they were so open and the video I showed you all was, you know, we had gone fishing at, as a community and just kind of, it was, it was a rough morning. It was a 5 a.m. kind of, and I did this multiple times, but I think my point is um, that was probably the most welcoming community that I experienced. I would just note a, a general observation that the biggest challenge isn't international and it's not interdisciplinary, it's being inclusive. And the, the decision makers, whoever they are, whatever institutions, governments, businesses, NGOs, um, more commonly than not say no. Um, and to the challenge in a sense is to address no. And I found that a good way is just to ignore it and to, <laughs> to follow your internal drummer and to try and act with responsibility and, and to be brave sometimes. I I guess I would like to add something to this discussion very briefly, and um, I'm grateful for um, what everybody else has said. And it just reminded me that I think another, I think our greatest challenge in communicating across differences, uh, perceived differences, is with the preconceptions that we come with. And one of my favorite stories from when I worked at the World Bank was when a sociologist was sent to the um, Andes to talk with different indigenous communities about whether they supported bilingual education. And they were having these conversations and, and then they reached a huge point of realization of misunderstanding because the World Bank sociologist was assuming that she was talking about uh, Quechua Spanish. But the indigenous people were thinking bilingual Spanish English because they were aware that their kids needed to learn English. And so the, once the indigenous people realized, wait a minute, you're talking about Quechua Spanish? It, no, that's not going to help us. So it's the preconceptions that we bring. And I really liked what um, Kirti said about its victims. You know, we come with these preconceived notions, and that is often our biggest stumbling block. While you're looking for a question, I, I would just note that a number of the questions in the chat and the comments relate to indigenous. And in terms of victims, I would say the, the world is a victim and doesn't recognize it yet. And that the real learning that's involved is to operate across generations, which is a fundamental feature of indigenous cultures. And, you know, the concept of seven generations, my, my grandparents, my parents, myself, my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. And if we're thinking in terms of sustainable development, the world has a lot to learn from indigenous peoples and how they've been resilient in the face of change. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, Paul, thanks for, for raising this uh, issue here. And th this is something that, uh, uh, just one example, little example, I will put, we are now eating what the industrial revolution, you know, have 
live today. But if we go back and see what we were able to eat, what, what we had in our tables you know, for lunching, you will see that it was really a good uh, source of uh, products that we have lost during the time, you know. When I come to the city, for example, I just learn how to eat potato, you know, in every way. But in my community, I was able, you know, to have a similar to potato in a five, six, seven, eight vari varieties of different, but not potato, but other kind of crops that uh, are similar, that has different uh, uh, qualities. And what, what happened? In, in, in uh, the, 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 the rural development is not taking into account these, these issues. Just we think that we have to teach whatever we have learned in the universities and the urban areas, and we have to impose, you know, in the communities and rural areas. But I think it has to be at the, at the reverse, you know, say, okay, now what we have left, now we have to recover. And Professor uh, uh, Paul said, okay, there are technologies also, you know, for, for using and for producing in some different uh, areas, in low lands, in a high lands. And, but now we just using machineries for, for using the land, for example, but, but our indigenous have many other technologies for that, but we didn't, are, we are not using that. And uh, there are many other things that I think if we give the opportunity to them, to us, to my community, to share that knowledge, I think the world can be a little bit different. Thank you. Um, another question um, that has come through is, as a person who's watching this webinar and you know is feeling inspired to do something about you know all the challenges that you've uh, come up with that you've explained, um, can you? just uh, give some actionable items that people might be able to uh, do or be involved with? If we, if we let me alone say something. One, we have raised in our presentation and said, there are ways to help to indigenous people to raise their voice and open to the world. One thing is we have to hear their lessons. You know? they, they have, a, they, they have a, their own histories and we have to hear them. And in some, uh, in some uh, opinions that is in the QA questions and said, okay, there are, uh, there are spaces like the United Nations. We have to give them spaces for listening to, to them. This is one thing. In the world, in the, in the market, we said that the market itself, it's specializing to some products and some standards and many other things that we are not using uh, as an indigenous producer. For example, we have a, uh, we, we don't depend on, on size, on weight. We don't depend on colors. The products are not uniform. And in that case, if all the community start to think that the pr production that is coming from indigenous regions uh, are not uh, uniform and start buying you know in uh, in in the, in the in the market in uh, behave in other way and uh, request to implement the an um, indigenous certification for example it could be really interesting and could help us to sell the product in the worldwide you know that could be a, a, a good way to participate. And of course, using the, 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 the media and uh, requesting the, their voices. That is something that we can do from our cell phone. Say, okay, what indigenous people think about climate change, like uh, Paul said before. Thank you. If, um, if there's anyone else who jump in there. I also, I think it's, it is a really interesting question. It's, it's a very weighted question. There are a lot of ways to go about it. There are a lot of incorrect and correct ways, I think, with, you know, gray lines to go about that too. Um, I'm assuming I'm talking to an audience that's not only from the U.S. I hope that there's some international people here. What I would say 
is start local. I think there is a press in the United States for, I mean, and I'll, I speak as a student of US institutions of like study abroad, study abroad, go, you know, and I think that's fantastic in some respects. But I think like Herman has, has said multiple times as well is get to know whether you want to start local and you want to do a science project that's local, you want to do a conservation policy project that's local, get to know the community you're doing it in. There are Ohlone tribes in the San Francisco Bay Area that have been wiped out that we don't know about. And as somebody from here who looks at this place and thinks, oh, it's so tech-based, so urban, it's easy to forget about our history and to forget about the original people that were and are here. Um, so I would say for any project, start local, get to know those cultures. Um, and then there was a second thing that I did want to add about that. Um, and I'm losing my train of thought now, but if I do remember, I'll point it out. The, the concept of local is, is, has been mentioned a couple of times as well. And I would say an observation, um, since we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of, of the Fulbright program, the Fulbright program emerged when nations began to bump into each other in the 20th century. Um, first World War, we had the League of Nations. The Second World War, we created the United Nations, International Monetary Fund, and, and other such. Uh, the world is different in the 21st century. And I would say the, the difference is that we now operate and need to operate better and differently um, at subnational, national, and international levels. That the transformations that will happen to operate on a planetary scale will not be at just international and national levels. They will happen from cities that have 10 million people in them, the mega cities, the urban centers that will happen from the villages because of the ability to communicate. So in a sense, the challenge that we collectively face at local to global scales is how to operate across a spectrum of jurisdictions, including subnational, national, and international. Agakia, um... Is there something we could, I'm a large uh, consumer of pine nuts, to be honest. So um, is there something I can do? Can I buy pine nuts directly from these people, remote people? Um, yes, uh, a lot of the pine nuts that are exported out of Kinar, um, most of it is for the Indian markets. And I'm not sure if any of it is exported out. Um, and, I, I'm not sure what we could do from here, but like some of the other people have expressed, I think it's mostly, it, it would be relevant for local state and national governments in India to take action, you know, by maybe um, monitoring better harvesting practices or, uh, you know, placing permits on the number of trees that are deforested or having, you know, all the Chilgoza forest, the common village Chilgoza forest is managed by the Himachal Pradesh Forest Department. So having better reforestation programs so um, the regeneration rate can increase. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure internationally what can be done, uh, but I think, as some people said, it's um, much of the action should be local. Well, thank you so much to the entire panel. Um, this has been a great uh, discussion. Um, this is being recorded, so attendees can watch this afterwards as well. Um, and if the panelists, before they head out, if you want to leave any links to any organizations or things that people can get involved with, you can do that in the chat. Just make sure you uh, put it to everyone. But um, thank you again and a virtual clap to all our panelists for this amazing uh, session. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Munir. Thank you all for coming and attending. It's been a pleasure. Follow your intuition. <laughs>